Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the 90s before I wound up working on every operating system there from MS-DOS to Windows 95, Windows NT, XP, and on through about Server 2003. And today I want to take you on a journey to a place that everybody has been, but few know the way there. How Hello World actually works on Windows. Imagine the simplest Windows program that you could write, one that just prints Hello World to the console. No windows, no events, no cursor, no mouse, just a simple text call. In C, this could be as minimal as including just the standard I.O. header and then calling printf hello world within your main function. You do it and the words appear as if by magic. But do you know how the magic happens? Well, in about 10 minutes you will, as I take you on a deep dive through each step on down through the compiler runtime, into the Windows 32 API, crossing the security boundary down into the NTOS kernel and the console subsystem, and ultimately across the PCIe bus to your GPU and then beyond. Behind this seemingly simple act lies a symphony of coordination, a journey through layers of software and hardware that make the right pixels light up at the right time in the right place. In fact, calling printf is like sending a messenger on a long cross-country journey from high-level code to low-level bits and back again. Our journey begins in user land within the heart of your C runtime library. Now, printf isn't just a magic function that spits text onto the screen somehow. The printf function first processes the format string, scanning for any placeholders like %s or %d, and replaces them with the corresponding variables that you provided. So your simple command undergoes some complex interpretation. The text you wrote, perhaps hello world in this case, is analyzed for any format specifiers. They're accounted for, but there aren't any in this case. And then the message is finally transformed into a raw text string, ready to be sent out. But where should it go? Well, in the world of C, standard output could mean to a console window, to a file, or even to a printer. For our purposes, behind the scenes, printf will dispatch this text to the standard output device, often the console, by calling another function, write file or write console A. Now, at this point, we jump from the runtime library into the operating system's vast Win32 API. This API is the gateway to everything in Windows, a colossal library that knows how to handle all sorts of resources from files to graphics, devices, and yes, ultimately console windows. By calling a write file or write console, your program reaches into the Win32 API to take control of a system resource. These functions are part of the Kernel32 DLL, a core system library that provides access to the fundamental features of Windows. The name Kernel32 DLL can be a bit misleading though. The kernel part suggests it's directly related to the operating system's kernel, but it's actually a user mode DLL. And here's why it has this name. First, some historical context. In the early days of Windows, especially with the transition to 32-bit from 16-bit with Windows 95 and NT, Microsoft restructured the system into modules that separated user mode and kernel mode functionality. The kernel in kernel32 DLL reflects its role in providing core system functions that interact closely with the operating system kernel, especially at a time when 32 bits was a key differentiator. So kernel32 DLL provides fundamental system functions for memory management, file I.O., process, and thread management, and more. While it runs in user mode, these functions need to interact closely with kernel mode code. The naming reflects its close association with the operating system's actual kernel functionality. Naming conventions in Windows have their roots in modularity and forward compatibility. Microsoft chose kernel32 as part of a set of 32-bit system DLLs alongside user32, GDI32, and others. So, in short, kernel32 DLL provides essential system functions in user mode, but it has this name because it wraps many core OS functions that make calls into kernel mode for you. Now back to your text. If your standard output for your process is pointing to the console, which is the default, then write console is likely the function that gets called. Write console takes the baton and prepares to move beyond user mode. To cross this boundary, Windows needs to execute a system call, a special mechanism for securely switching from user mode, where the applications run, into kernel mode, where the operating system's core operates. In modern versions of Windows, this transition is facilitated by a mechanism called the System Descriptor Table, which maps system call numbers to their corresponding kernel functions. The transition occurs through a tiny piece of code inside of write console. Using a syscall, or int2e instruction, Windows triggers an interrupt. The interrupt vector points to code that sends the request into the kernel's realm. And why are we doing this? Because user mode can't touch any system resources directly, be they the console or the screen or anything else. Only the kernel code running in a privileged processor mode can do so. So our write console API is going to ask the kernel to do the real work on its behalf. 
When a program in user mode needs to access system resources, like opening a file or allocating memory, it cannot directly interact with the hardware or kernel. Instead, it makes a request to the operating system through a system call. And a system call is like knocking on the door of the kernel, asking it to perform an action on the program's behalf. When this request is made, the CPU must shift from user mode to kernel mode, a transition that grants the program controlled access to system level functions. The shift actually happens through that int 2 e instruction, which effectively says, pause the regular program, let's handle this operating system level operation right now. The instruction triggers the CPU to switch to a privileged mode, which is normally ring zero on Intel processors, granting access to the full resources of the system. During this switch, the CPU looks up a designated entry point for the system call stored in that table, and it begins executing kernel code at that entry. The user mode program passes parameters to the kernel, indicating what it needs, like requesting to read from a file and what its name is, or to allocate memory and how many bytes. Once inside the kernel, the operating system checks that the request is valid and secure, ensuring that the program isn't trying to access anything it shouldn't. It also has to check parameter validation to make sure there's no buffer overruns or anything else that could wind up being used as an exploit. If the request passes all validation, the kernel performs the operation, like reading the data from the disk or allocating the memory, and then returns the result. In our case, it's going to do the actual text output or send it at least on its way and then return to our control. Finally, the CPU then switches back to user mode, resuming the program's normal execution where it left off, with any results from the system call returned back to the program. This entire process happens pretty rapidly, but the back and forth between user mode and kernel mode is fundamental to maintaining security and stability in a multitasking environment. Now, we're right at the point where our message enters the Windows kernel. At the kernel level, write console's call lands on NT write console, one of the many services within NTOS kernel.exe, the Windows kernel binary. NT write console checks the parameters, like we said, ensures that the calling process has whatever permissions it needs to write to the console, and handles any necessary input and output control codes, or ioctals. Here, Windows identifies the output target and determines whether or not it's truly a console. And with that verification, the kernel then routes the request to another key piece of Windows the Client Server Runtime Subsystem, or CSRSS.exe. The role of CSRSS is crucial. It's the console's guardian, a service managing each console window in the system. CSRSS runs in user mode but has special privileges and responsibilities, including handling console windows and process thread creation and deletion. Once anti-write console notifies CSRSS that data is on the way, CSRSS updates the console's output buffer, which holds the text to be displayed. This buffer is a two-dimensional array representing the characters and their attributes, like their color and intensity and blinking and underline and so on, on the console screen. But updating the buffer is just one step in our journey. Next, CSRSS needs to turn that text into visible output. Enter the Windows Graphics Device Interface, or GDI, a graphics library responsible for rendering visuals, including the letters and symbols in the console window. GDI provides a set of functions for drawing lines, curves, and text, and handling fonts, and managing color palettes. To write our message on the screen, CSRSS collaborates with GDI, creating a device context, essentially a container holding all of the drawing properties like font and color for the console. With GDI's help, the text is then rendered into pixels and positioned exactly where it belongs in the console window. You might be surprised to hear that even console windows ultimately use GDI, since they seem to be more like an old output of a character generator, a 6545 chip, or similar. Console windows do have some unique characteristics in how they interact with the system, and it's not immediately obvious that they actually do rely on GDI for rendering. While they certainly look a lot simpler than typical graphical windows, they still need a mechanism to render that text and to handle the basic drawing tasks, especially in older versions of windows, and GDI is that mechanism. Originally, Windows didn't have a separate console subsystem. Console windows in early Windows NT relied heavily on CSRSS to handle all console operations, and this included interacting with GDI for rendering. CSRSS essentially serves as a go-between, allowing console applications to display text and receive user input without directly manipulating the hardware. GDI provides the drawing functions for these interactions, rendering text and handling the basic graphics for the console window on the screen. More modern versions of Windows, especially since about Windows Vista, have actually abstracted much of this away. For instance, the console window host or conhost.exe was introduced to help modernize and separate console rendering from CSRSS while still allowing compatibility with old legacy applications. 
conhost.exe now directly handles much of the console Windows presentation, but it still calls on GDI for text and basic rendering in a way that keeps console Windows visually consistent with the traditional look and feel. Yet drawing in Windows isn't as simple as just telling the pixels where to go. GDI hands the rendered instructions to the graphics driver, which operates in kernel mode and translates these high-level commands into hardware-specific instructions for your graphics card. This involves the use of the Windows Display Driver Model, or WDDM, which standardizes how graphics drivers communicate with the operating system. In the kernel, the graphics driver uses the Display Driver Interface, or DDI, an intermediary between GDI and the physical hardware. This ensures that our message, now no longer just text, but data specifying position, color, and intensity, is ready for the next step. Finally, that's where the graphics card takes over. It receives the data and interprets it for its own needs. The GPU's firmware and the driver translate these instructions into operations on the GPU's processing units. At this point, our message is finally represented in the frame buffer, the region of memory in the GPU where each pixel of the screen's image resides. With the frame buffer updated, the graphics card converts the data into a signal, sending it through the HDMI, DisplayPort, or whatever video interface you're using. The signal adheres to specific protocols like TMDS, or the Too Much Data Standard for HDMI, ensuring that the data is accurately transmitted to the monitor. The signal travels along cables through the monitor circuitry, and ultimately the text is converted into light by the monitor's LEDs or pixels. That light, in the form of photons, travels through your transparent corneas and lands on your retinas, where it is absorbed by rods and cones that stimulate your optic nerve. The optic nerve, carrying the signal generated by your rods and cones, fires a series of electrical impulses toward your brain. These impulses travel along a complex network of neurons passing through your optic chiasm, where fibers from each eye partially cross, allowing both hemispheres of the brain to process information from both fields of vision. These signals continue along the optic tracks, finally arriving at the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN, of the thalamus. In the LGN, the signals are sorted and relayed to the primary visual cortex, in the occipital lobe, where the raw data is further processed. Here, your brain begins interpreting edges, shapes, and patterns. Specialized neurons in the visual cortex, each sensitive to different aspects of the image, such as its orientation, color, and spatial frequency, analyze the input in parallel. These neurons all collaborate to reassemble the image, sending the information to higher level visual areas that contribute to recognizing the lines and forms as the text that you see as Hello World. And if you're actually a programmer, you will then receive a significant dopamine reward because your code actually ran and worked. So when Hello World pops up on the screen, you're witnessing the endpoint of a complex coordinated process that spans libraries, API, system calls, kernel services, device interfaces, and hardware components. Each layer abstracts complexity, providing interfaces that allow higher level components to function without needing to understand the intricate details beneath them. A single function call in C triggers a cascade of events through the layers of software and hardware, showcasing the eminence power, and yes, the elegance, of the Windows operating system. And with that, Printf has finished its journey, a journey so intricate that it's easy to forget how much has happened beneath the surface, even for one simple line of code. If you found today's trip down into the kernel and back to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Consider turning on the notification bell. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.